Hey, good morning, Anchor family. So glad you're joining us online today. Whether you're watching on Facebook with us or whether you're checking out on Vimeo or our YouTube page, we're so thankful that you decided to join with us today and to spend time looking at God's Word. And I'm excited to share it with you today. I'm excited to look at some of the wisdom that uh, the ways that wisdom really impact us. The way we look at the wisdom of God, you know, when we're chasing after the things of God and not chasing after the things of the world, and just what a blessing that is to us today. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I can think back at my life of so many different um, I told you so stories. So many ways where if I would have just listened, I wouldn't have messed things up, right? I remember one time when I was helping my mom, she was unpacking this brand new uh, patio set that she had gotten, and there was this, of course, bubble wrap around the, the ceramic kind of countertop that she had, and I was taking it apart, and I was trying to be careful, but was not careful enough. I'm being warned by, by my wife and by my mom, and everyone said, hey, don't pull too hard on that. It's going to, and before I know it, it's too late. I've broken the table, this brand new thing, and I'm just a fool. You know, Everyone's got, and I told you so story, where if I would have just listened and gone the right way, it would have worked out much better, right? I think as Christians, we know the answer to this question. How should we live life? It's doing things God's way, right? Because that's the right way to do it. He, the creator of all things, has made things in such a way that we ought to pay attention to him when he says, this is how relationships ought to work. This is how life ought to work. This is how you ought to connect with God and with so many other ways. You know, I told you so is not a story we want to hear. We want to hear, I obeyed and I went the right way. Well, that's not what we always do. We chase our own thoughts. We chase our own ideas. We still kind of war with the flesh from the past and the way we used to be. We go and we do that at the expense of ourselves. So today, as we explore God's words, we continue through this series on Ecclesiastes, looking at the wisdom uh, that we get, which is, again, pursuing the things of God and contrasting that with folly, which is not pursuing the things of God. We're going to start to see the benefits that come, the really the blessing that comes from walking in wisdom from doing things God's way, from following His way and finding that life is blessed when we follow God's way. I hope you know that principle already. I hope you understand that you can you get that principle. I hope by the time we're done with this message, you're going to internalize it. You're going to take it to heart. You're going to feel it. You're going to know it in your core as you see more than just the logic that's behind it, the blessing that comes from behind it. So if you have your Bibles, get them open to Ecclesiastes chapter 6, and we're going to start looking again at the blessing of following God through wisdom at pushing away from the things that where we're chasing ourselves. And so we're going to start with verses 10 through 12 in chapter 6. And these verses just say very quickly here, say, Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one who is stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity, and what advantage is that to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which passes like a shadow. This quick time, remember, just like a shadow going by. For who can tell man what will be after him and after under the sun? Now, I titled this section right here just for us to to kind of break this big piece down that we're looking at today. It's just this overview of God is over all things. God is over all things. There is nothing outside of the control of God, the plan, the purpose. God is well in control of all things. And as a matter of fact, uh, this fact here needs to be solidified in your soul as a Christian. This has got to be set in your soul. This can't just be something I understand, a Christian principle. This has got to be something that is set, solidified in your core, in your heart, in your mind, in every area of life. And if you don't have that, you're going to struggle in every area of life. If you can't see that God is in control of all things working here, good, bad, indifferent, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what's going on, if we cannot see that God is working that way and start to believe that that God is doing those things, we're going to struggle with it. And that's going to start to cause problems for us. We're going to start to say, I can't see God working in that. I can't see this. I don't know how this is all working around and what that's going to do to us. It's going to start having us chasing our own logic again. We're going to start trying to make sense of things that God has set in a certain way that we may not be able to grasp yet. There are things we might have to grow to, things we might have to walk through to become the people that He wants us to be in order to grasp the things that He's got for us. If we don't have this fact solidified in our core that God is over all things, we are going to struggle in all things. But when we understand that God has things worked out when He has a plan and a purpose for all things, that they all work for His glory, for our benefit, that's where we really start to see how things should be. That's where we start to get a measure of rest. It's where we start to see the benefit and the fruit of doing what we're talking about today, walking in wisdom before God. If we don't do that, we're going to rebel. We're going to start to rationalize bad behavior. We're going to start to think that our ideas, our opinions, the way we do things is better than God's. That will say, God's word says this. I don't agree with that. I'm going to go my own way. 
can I tell you, just, just gently but with some emphasis, uh, as your pastor, as your friend, your opinion does not outrank the Word of God. How you feel about something does not impact the truth of God. And we've got to understand that, that we as finite people don't understand all these things. But we walk in this, we trust in the Lord, and as we walk in wisdom, as we explore today, we're going to see how to do that in great detail. We're not going to go the way of futility. We're going to go the way of wisdom. Because wisdom, next thing I'd like you to know, wisdom gives insights for a better life. Wisdom gives us insight for a better life. That's what we see come to light in verses 1 through 9 of chapter 7. I'm going to read these fairly quickly because it's kind of set in a proverbial format. It's a bunch of sayings that are meant to give us some big impact in short little bursts here. So let me go verses 1 through 9 of chapter 7. It says, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness the face of the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise, verse 4 says, is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. This is not a very fun thing to talk about, is it? This doesn't, this kind of goes against what we normally think about things. Verse 5, he says, it's better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. You know, this is kind of rubbing against the grain, isn't it? We like the happy stuff, but he's saying the, the sad stuff, the hard stuff of life, that's what really is working better here. Verse 6 goes on to say, For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity. Man, he walks through so many different things that kind of uh, check us, don't they? I mean, that's what I really see coming apart in these verses. We would normally want to go the exact opposite of what he said. I mean, I would much rather go to the house of happiness than to the house of mourning. I don't want to go to the place of struggle and strife. I want to go to a place of ease and contentment, right? Just the natural, the, the human person in me, the, 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 honestly, the laziness sometimes wants to just go that way. But he says the blessing here is in these other things. Now, why would he say something like that? Why would that go so contrary to what our normal logic is and, the simple answer is, is you need a reality check. I need a reality check. Sometimes I need things to pull me out of where I'm thinking to get me on the right path, to get me directed towards things. We need reality checks. And that's what we see coming up out here. As he breaks these pieces down, he talks about different elements that kind of surprise us. Again, we wouldn't expect to hear it's better to go to the house of mourning. That's what he says in, in like verses 1, two, uh, 1 through 5. He says, the day of death is better than birth. Why would it be better to die than to be born to start things? He says, it's better to be in the house of mourning than the house of happiness. It's better to have sorrow than laughter. To live in the house of mourning is where the wise are, the ones we're trying to be, the people who follow after God. The fool, though, the one who goes after the, the things of the world, they live in the house of pleasure. Again, why would, he, why would he say this? Because you and I need a reality check. We don't live in reality. We're always chasing the, the fun. We're chasing the experience. And we live in a world that rewards that, that emphasizes that, that says everything is just about how it makes you feel. Let's just chase happiness. Let's chase pleasure. Let's chase excitement. Let's chase new experiences. Our fleshly bodies love that. And you know, to some degree, it's actually good to do those things. God has given us a blessing of the freedom to do that. We talked even a couple weeks ago about how the Christian is the person on earth who's actually able to enjoy life with or without wealth, but we can enjoy wealth as well. We can enjoy some of those good things there, but we don't just live there in that bit of merriment and happiness. There are times where we have other things that come into life. Even though we would like to, living in joy and constant happiness, the, the running around of everything so exciting all the time, that's, that's just not reality, right? Even though we'd like to, we can't live that way. And we know this principle if we think about it, right? Because if we're starving, we know that Skittles or candy is not going to satisfy like a pit of meat and vegetables and good stuff for us, right? It's going to leave us wanting. It's going to tell us, hey, I'm going to fill up your stomach, but it's not going to content us. It's not going to feed us the way we need to be fed. It's going to leave us wanting. And it's going to do it quickly, by the way. And that's what we see come to light in verse 6, where he says, this is like the crackling of thorns under a pot. As I thought about this, I realized, you know, for uh, our New Mexican culture, we would probably understand this a little bit better if we talked about tumbleweeds and not just the thorns in the pot. Because if you've ever had tumbleweeds run through your yard, you know all about this, especially if you've tried to get rid of them by burning them. 
because if you've ever caught a tumbleweed on fire, you've noticed that it doesn't take much to catch it, right? It goes super fast and it burns up very quickly, very hot. So, I mean, it just, it's engulfed in a ball of flame almost the second a flame hits it and then it burns out almost instantly. It comes with this big boom, this big bang, this, this big explosion almost of fire that goes across us, this huge intense heat. And then just like that, it's gone. That's what happens with the laughter of fools. That's what happens with the things of this world. We get this big, huge, exciting thing that happens then just as quickly as it came. It's gone. Like thorns, like tumbleweeds burning up. They're there quickly and then they're just gone. And that's what happens when we chase the things of the world. You might get a big bit of incitement right there, but before you know it, it's gone. That's what happens when we walk through these things. To the contrary, when we deal with the difficult things of life, when the realities that are there, that helps us live wisely because when we start to live wisely, we start to act wisely. We start to live rightly as an outpouring of knowing the wisdom. You know, this is a point that uh, many people who are new to the faith have a hard time struggling to understand. They would think, man, Jesus saved me and praise God for it. Amen. And everything is great in life when Jesus saved us. I remember that excitement when I first understood I get to go to heaven. I get to know God. I get to tell other people about him. What a blessing that is. How exciting is that? But then not long after that, we start to face struggle. And we start to, start to taste, have challenges come into our lives. And we start to face so many other things in life that are not just the happy things. That's why it's a struggle for new people because we don't realize, uh, people who are new to the faith, we don't realize that Jesus promised us life to the full, the fullest, the best life, but not a perfect and pain-free life. We're promised eternal life. We're not promised a perfect, peaceful life here, not one that's free from struggle. Death, sorrow, and pain are things that no one likes to talk about, but those are the things that we need to because they keep us in reality. That's silencing the truth of things. As, as much as we would like to push off the, the hard struggles in life, we want to push off pain, death, bills, the struggles, the, the pains of, of strained relationships, of walking with people who are being selfish or being selfish ourselves. We don't want to deal with those things. We want just the happiness. But it says here in the Word that wisdom lives in the house of reality. <laughs> living in the here and the now, and taking the good, taking the bad, and rejoicing in it with the Lord. You know, we need balance, and that's why we have both of these things. That's why we have both of these things, to have a positive and negative thing in life and respond to them rightly. That helps us to stay balanced. It helps us to think rightly, to live wisely. Job said this exact kind of sentiment in Job 2.10. He says, Shall we accept the good from God, but not the trouble? God gives the good. God brings in and works in the bad. And sometimes He brings the bad because sometimes we need the bad. Sometimes we need to be checked in that. We need balance, but we also need, sometimes we need struggle to grow. We need struggle to grow. You know, that brings to mind two different examples for me. Back in 1987, uh, the Russian Space Center, or, what, or their, uh, their Russian Space Program, invented a suit they called the Penguin Suit that was designed to help a very big problem they had with their cosmonauts. When they would go into space, they would spend quite a bit of time up there, you know, 100 days, 200 days, 300 days, and they would come back and their muscles would atrophy. They would kind of seize up. They'd be very weak because in space, you don't have the gravity. You don't have the pull that you need there. And so people would come back and even a month, two months later, the astronauts or the cosmonauts that came back, they needed help from people just to walk and to do basic things because they had been in space for so long. And so they invented this penguin suit that involved putting straps of elastic between here and here and here and here and on the legs. So there was always resistance when they would work through there. And then the first cosmonaut to wear that through that resistance of that penguin suit came back and was perfectly fine, able to walk out on his own power right when he came back to Earth after spending longer time in space than other people had done before. It was that resistance. It was that strength. It was that pulling. It was that exercise of things that made him do that. You see, without that kind of resistance in there, we can't grow. We don't find the strength to carry on. We need that balance. Another example I can think of is a, a little boy I heard about who was out in his yard one day and he saw a chrysalis, you know, a butterfly that had not yet come out of, from his cocoon. But just as the boy was watching, he realized, oh, it's happening now. The, the little chrysalis is starting to shake and, and the little boy sees that little head of that butterfly start to peek out and starts to break off the shell of that cocoon there. And he says, man, this is beautiful. It's amazing. Man, let's help this little guy get out of there. So he starts to peel off the little pieces of the chrysalis of the cocoon that had not broken off yet. And as he did that, the butterfly was able to get out and it fell right to the ground and made a couple more wriggles. 
and then died. And he asked his mom what had happened, and he came to find out that some of that breaking out of the cocoon, some of that fighting of the wings built up the strength of that butterfly. You see, without that resistance, without that strength, that butterfly could not even get the strength to carry on, to go on, to fly away out of there. And these are some of the same things that we're talking about here. If we don't face struggle, if we don't find resistance, we're not going to grow. We're not going to find the strength we need. We're not even going to be living in reality. If all we ever see is the good, never work with the bad. And James, the book of James, tells us a very important principle in this. It says in chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, The testing of your faith produces perseverance. Verse 4 says, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. You know, that's the literal goal we have here on earth, to be mature in our faith, to be more like Jesus all the time, and that's what perseverance does. Perseverance pushes us in there, helps us, it strengthens us as we go through these hard times. It says we should be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Verse 5 goes on to say, If any of you lacks wisdom, listen, this is what we're talking about. Wisdom, growing in this. If we lack the wisdom on how to do that, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Church, wisdom is received. It's strengthened, and it produces a good reward through struggles. Let me say that again. Wisdom is received, strengthened, and produces a good reward through our struggles. So we may not like those things that come in there, but church, we've got to appreciate the value that is there because of what happens from it. It helps us to see that a life that is lived rightly finds in wisdom finds a better life. A life that is lived rightly and in wisdom finds a better life. This is not the key to happiness because I'm not promising happiness. What I am saying is that when we walk in wisdom, we find blessing. We find the better life, the life that we're supposed to have here. Not a life free of struggles, but one that walks in wisdom. And so as we continue looking through this here, we're going to see there are some principles that we can practice, some things that we can do, some elements of wisdom that will help us see the value of this and hopefully start to walk towards those things all the more. And one of those things I want you to notice, if you're note takers, you can actually find this again in our version notes as well, is uh, the first thing is, is that wisdom gives clarity. Wisdom brings clarity to life here. Verses 10 through 12 of chapter 7 tells us this and says, Say not, why were the former days better than these ones? How come those days? How come the days passed? I remember back in high school, that used to be great. I remember back then, that used to be great. Why do we say the former days are better than these? It's not wisdom that made you ask this. It's not wisdom that made you lust after the past. It says, Wisdom is good with an inheritance and advantage those who seek, who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. The warning here is not that we just wouldn't live in the past, but that we would be content with what is going on here and now. This is some of what we talk about throughout this whole entire series, being content with what God has provided here and now. He's not just talking about not living in the past. He's saying, don't be dissatisfied with what's going on now. Don't look at the past like that's better. Don't look back and say, those are the glory days. Those might have been great times. Praise God for them, but they're not the only thing. And we get an idea about this and, and thinking about this rightly from Philippians chapter 3, where Paul told us in verse 13, he's forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I'm not focused on my past successes. I'm not even looking at my past failures. Certainly I want to learn from those. Certainly I want to grow from those. But I don't want to live there. That's the past. It's not here anymore. I don't live in the past. I live in the here and the now, right? Man, that's, that's a reality check for us, isn't it? As much as we would like to live back in those glory days, we live in the here and the now. We need the reality check that their life's still going on now. It's wisdom that allows us to have this perspective because the here and now varies. The here and the now varies. And just as we noted a minute ago, we look at the good and the bad. We take the good, we take the bad, we bring them together and we still walk in it, we still live in that. This clarity becomes all the more evident as you live in it. As you walk through practically going through these things here. You see, verse 12 does something for us. It says that wisdom delivers on all the promises that money lies about. Money tells us all the time, I'm going to solve all your problems. That's, that's what we tell ourselves. I just need that raise. I just need that extra bit of income. And you know, that's okay. If you want to get those things, if you can get those things, praise God for them, but they're not going to solve all your problems in life. 
Money says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make life great. Everything. That's not what happens. Wisdom promises that and wisdom delivers on it. Money says, I'll give you this. And money does give things for a time, but then money runs out. You know, money says, I'm going to take care of you. Wisdom does take care of you. People who get money use it to take care of themselves, certainly. But it's fleeting. It's going to go away. Wisdom, once, po once possessed, will protect you. Because wisdom is how you think. It's how you live. It's how you act. Wisdom is something that gets in there and does not go away. Your whole being is strengthened. Your whole person, the inner person, is strengthened through wisdom. You're built up. You're encouraged. You're stronger for having had it. Whereas wealth will only cover you while you have it. No, Jesus warned us about this. He says, don't store up treasures on earth. Why? Because rust is going to destroy. It's going to break it down. Thieves can break in and steal. You can lose money, but you can't lose wisdom. You can't not, you can not practice wisdom. You cannot do the wisdom, but you can't lose it. You can have it. Once you're wise, you don't redo stupid stuff, hopefully. You know, if we find out, oh, the stove is hot, I burned my hand. You don't go back and say, let's just double check, right? I learned my lesson already. That's one of my, my favorite lines from uh, one of my favorite movies. It's called Trapped in Paradise. It's this uh, group of guys, they're, they're thieves. They get out of jail and they're, they're running around doing this whole other thing. They get caught stealing again. And one of the guys says, I can't go back to jail. I learned my lesson already. Obviously, you did not learn your lesson to not steal if you got caught stealing again. And we do that same kind of thing in our life. We go after money thinking that's going to satisfy it, and it does not do that. Wisdom, though, has taught us a lesson that will impact us and will stay there. Wisdom delivers on the promises that money cannot do. Wisdom will provide for us. Wisdom will take care of us. And again, wisdom is not just knowing stuff. Now, we're talking about the principle of wisdom means following after the things of God, pursuing the eternal things. Wisdom allows you to see things clearly. Because you notice in verse 10 it says, it's not wisdom that has you living in those glory days, those old days that were better than now you think. It's not wisdom that do that. He's obviously inferring that it is foolishness that chases that. It's not wisdom. Maybe you remember uh, the movie uh, Napoleon Dynamite. Uncle Rico's in there. He's making all these things about the glory days. He says, I bet I could throw a football over that mountain. He's so excited, he remembers back to the glory days of playing football in high school and just not living anywhere close to the here and the now and thinking about life. He's back in those old days. Maybe you do that. I, you know, I, I have some great memories that I do treasure from the past. I, I love days. I remember like when the kids were super little. I love those times. I love the times now too. I love times when I was single. It was just my wife and I together and we had that bit of time before we had kids. I love some of the past, but I don't live in the past. I don't take my joy, my hope, my peace from that, you know. Wisdom can take joy in the past, but it doesn't live there. It's gone. The past is gone. It's non-existent. It's like the life of the person who lives there. The person who lives in the past doesn't live in reality. The past does not exist anymore. It's a memory. It's gone. It's, it's, it's past. We're not there anymore, so don't try to live there. Live in the here and the now. Think clearly about these things and you will be walking in wisdom. Living in the reality of life, looking at things clearly and in what God has provided allows you to rest in that. It also helps us to be free from some of the struggle of discontent and that's what we see in verses 13 through 18 where I'm kind of captioning this or titling this little section here is that wisdom provides rest. We're constantly running, trying to do things in life when we need some rest, and wisdom provides that for us. Chapter 7, verses 13 through 18 says this. It says, consider the work of God. You know, just a, let's stop there for just a moment. If you have a highlighter handy, highlight that. If you have a pen handy, make some exclamation points around that. Make, make it look like a sunburst in your Bible because this is a very key point. Consider the work of God. Think on the things of God. He goes on to say here, Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what He has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made me, had made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, 
and from that with not, uh, that withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. I wonder how many of you have thought at a time, I need a break. I just need a break from life. I need a break from worry. I need a break from struggle. I need just a break in general. I mean, you fill in the blank. What do you need a break from? There's so many things I know in life. We've got that. We have so many things in life that have been designed to help provide rest for us, right? So many things are supposed to help us get back some of the time that we've lost. You know, we've got cell phones so we don't have to go all over the place. We have a full computer in our hand right now so we don't have to run around. We can work anywhere. But we have other kinds of computers. We have apps, we have planners, we automate our payments, we do bill pay like that, you know, we order everything from clothes to our food online, we listen to podcasts at two times the speed so we can get done it faster, there's a litany of other things that we do to make life easier and provide some relief because we need a break, don't we? And once we put all those things in there, when we make those auto payments, when we set up the time so we can have the rest, what do we do with all that rest? We fill it with more time, with more stuff that we do. Wisdom helps us to find the measure of rest that we need. It allows us to say rightly at times, no, I can't do that. Wisdom says, I'm going to chase the things that matter, and if I'm not chasing the things that don't matter, I have the ability to rest. But we also rest in that in a lot of different ways. And the key way we do that is what I just had you highlight, underline, or exclamation point all around your Bible. How do we find that rest? How do we walk in that rest? How does wisdom provide that rest? By considering the things of God. By considering the things of God, by thinking deeply about who God is and what He does. Think about this. Are you powerful enough to overcome what God has set? That's exactly what the verse 13 said. Who are you? Can you make something crooked or make something straight that God has made crooked? Consider the work of God. Do you have the authority to call anything that He does into question? Will you walk up to God and say, you shouldn't have done that? You might have a heart that disagrees or has been hurt to say that, but you don't have the authority to go up and say that. Is, is your opinion more impactful on the things of life than the truths of Scripture? Do you look at something and say, oh, the Bible says this, but I don't like that because I don't prefer that. Can you change anything he does? And the answer to all those is no. You don't have the authority to question him. No, you can't change that. I mean, can you swing your arms fast enough so that you would fly? No. And when you consider the things of the facts of, can you flap your arms at... Of course not. When you consider it, you know you can't do that. When you consider this, you would know. And when you consider the things of God, how they impact life and everything, how God set things, you start to get a good perspective. I start to see that when I consider the things of God, the things of the world are nowhere near as impactful. They're nowhere near as important. Church, His plans are higher, better, and greater, aren't they? Rest in that. If He's in control, of all things, if we can't make any change to what he's done, if, if he's made it crooked, we can't say be straight because he's got it that way, rest in that. Instead of striving on your own way, start trusting and engaging more with him. Rest in that. The Bible tells us to do this. This is a good thing to be able to just consider the things that God allows us to rest in him. Psalm 46.10 gives us this charge in the NIV, the New International Version. It says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I love that. What a peace it brings. Stop working so hard. Just, just rest. Just trust and know that I am God. And I also looked at the New American Standard Version of that, that says, Stop striving. Stop working so hard. Rest in God. Stop trying to do all these things on your own. Stop trying to do it your own way. Stop chasing ways that are contrary to what the Bible says. Because when we consider the things of God and see that they work the right way, we know from history that God has done those things the right way. We can be still. We can rest. That's where we find the rest, by considering the things of God. Because when we consider that, we realize, Lord, you've got it under control. There's no problem for me to trust in you, to rest in you, because you've got it under control. If he's got it under control, we don't have to worry about it anymore. We just walk after him. Church family, you know, I'm, I am convinced that much of the problem we see in the world and much of the problem we see in the church today is that we don't know God the way that we should. We trust Him for our salvation, but we don't bring Him in and trust Him for our finances. We don't trust Him for how to handle relationships. We don't trust Him for how to deal with that coworker who might be rude to us. We don't trust Him in so many other ways. We think, I can handle that side. Jesus, you've got the salvation side. I'll take it from here. 
when we need Him in every single element of life. Whatever God provides is best at that time. We walk in the things that happen and we don't say, I'm going to try to change it and this and that. We might have aspirations. God may lead you to do certain things, but the ultimate goal of this is that we would rest in whatever God has given. That's what verse 14 tells us. Verse 14 here. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. When God gives you a good day, praise God for it. When God gives you a day of adversity, Consider this. This is how you deal with the day of adversity. Consider that God has made them both. That's how we can say that thing we repeat over and over and over from Romans 8.28, that God works all things for good for those who love Him and who are called according to His purposes. We rest in that truth. It's not a flippant Christian thing that says, well, I guess I'll just deal with it. That is an assurance. That is the joy that only the Christian has that says, this happened in life, and I'm going to trust that it worked for God's glory and for my benefit. We don't know God the way we should because if we did, we wouldn't be chasing so many things that we chase. We as the church, anchor church, we have got to be the ones who are leading at the forefront that say, I trust in God. I follow God. I don't just do a time of reading in the morning. There's a time where I connect with the living God and He impacts how I think. He impacts how I act. He impacts how I do everything in life. When we know Him better, we are able to rest in Him better. That's where wisdom is at. Resting in Him there, that's where wisdom is at. We can't always understand or discern the things that happen in life. We can't make sense of stuff that happens sometimes. And that's why it's the best thing in the world for us to rest in God, to consider the things of God. Because when we do that, that allows us to pray rightly what Jesus taught us to pray. It keeps us the heart attitude right that says, Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, whatever comes in life, I want your kingdom first. I want your will, your way in my life. Whatever you're doing, Jesus, Work there in my life. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. That was true when Jesus said it. It was true in Solomon's day. It's true in ours. You know, verses 18 or 15 through 18 give an example of a man not understanding things, not being able to make sense of how God works. And he gives these examples. You know, the one who should live long doesn't live long. We see the wicked person prosper while the righteous struggles. Ecclesiastes 9.11, he says this. He says, the race is not to the swift. He says, I've seen something under the sun, essentially, that doesn't make sense to me. 9.11 says, the race doesn't go to the swift. The battle doesn't go to the strong. Food doesn't go to the wise. Wealth doesn't go to the brilliant. The favor to the learned. Life doesn't always make sense, does it? As a matter of fact, life rarely makes sense. The only thing that works for us is to say, God works in all of it. God is over all things. It is futile for man to try to understand all the workings and all the ways of God because they're so much higher than ours. So instead of that, instead of trying to figure it all out, instead of trying to do it all our own way, we rest in God because that's what wisdom allows us to do. I don't know how many of you out there right now are are hearing this message and thinking, Carl, I need that break you're talking about. I need that rest There's this element in life. This is element at work. There's this something that's going on in my relationships. Let me encourage you to do what verse 13 says. Consider the things of God. Put your mind onto the things of God. And when we're focused on the things of God, everything else pushes to the side. Nothing else matters in there. We still take care of the other things. Wisdom allows us to rest in Him. Allows us to have peace about this you know, verse 17 tells us it's a death sentence to not live wisely. Chasing yourself into wickedness or even into some good pursuits can be tragic for you. Verse 17 says, don't be overly wicked, neither be a fool. Don't go so far into being holier than thou and righteous. Absolutely pursue righteousness to the nth degree. Go after and stray from that wicked things. But there's this balance that's in life here where we are taking what God has given and walking appropriately. And wisdom allows us to make those right decisions to walk the right way. When we're resting in this, we find balance, we find wisdom, and we are allowed to rest. You know, we're not resting in, in good things or giving up in bad. We're not taking this at face value. We are resting in who God is because that's where the rest is. That's why we consider the things of God. We rest in Him. We consider who God is, what He does, all our part in all of this. We ought to be able to rest. You know, I, um, I love when I've got a huge bit of things to do, a huge task, a huge list of stuff to do, and someone comes along on side and says, Carl, can I help you with that? Because they take that thing off my plate, and then I don't have to do it anymore, right? I don't have to worry about it anymore. I've given it to someone else. I've delegated that task. They've taken it, and it's done. I don't have to think about it anymore. 
Folks, I don't mean to make this overly simple, but that's exactly what God does with us in life. We still have responsibility to do the things we're supposed to do, but we rest in that God is going to take care of this, isn't He? We say it all the time, but do we believe it in our hearts? Do we know that God is over all things? I know we can grab it up here. Can we take it in here? Can we take it in our heart? Because that's where we've got to do it. Now, church, can I give you just this little encouragement? If you need help in this, if you need rest in this, consider the things of God. He has it well under control. Now, C.H. Spurgeon, the, the famous pastor from years back, said, Half our fears arise from our neglect of the Bible. Half of our fears arise from neglect of the Bible. What's that saying? To Maybe our fears will go away if we would spend some time considering the things of God. Spending time dwelling on the things of God, not dwelling on the negative things of life, not even necessarily dwelling on the great things of life, dwelling on the things of God in general. Wisdom provides rest. And the last one here I want to end on here with a practical point is that wisdom provides strength. Wisdom provides strength. This is illustrated by looking at the strength of kings and the strength of people's opinion. Look at uh, chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes, verses 19 through 24. He says, Wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than to ten rulers who are in the city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself, that's me, myself, have cursed others. All this I have tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been far off and deep and very deep, who can find out? You know, I think this analogy of a king here is very, very interesting. Because if you think about it, as we consider the things here of God, as the king is the most powerful person in the land, isn't he? His wish is your command as the subject there. He is wealthy. He has subjects. He has plentiful resources. He has an army. He has chariots. He has the respect of others. He has a, a network of resources to provide anything that he would ever want. They have bodyguards to protect them so that they are untouchable. They have subjects that care for their every need. They have teachers and, and uh, counselors who inform them about every area of life and what's going on around them. That's a person who has impact and strength, right? And in this example, he says there are ten of them, ten kings, fortified cities, ten kings who have this kind of power, this kind of influence, this kind of uh, ability here. And he says that those ten combined cannot compare to the person who is walking in wisdom with God. There's nothing that can compare to the nth degree, to be the biggest person you could be. The modern translation is you could be Jeff Bezos. You could have the kind of wealth. You could have the kind of accolades. You could have the kind of influence over so many elements of life, and you still don't have anything compared to the person who has the wisdom of God. Wisdom provides greater strength than that. It also provides greater strength than an area that many people struggle with, people's opinion. When we are set on the things of God, we don't deal so much with people's opinion. Verses 21 through 23 says that wisdom allows us to be free from opinions of others because we walk in truth, not in opinions. You know, maybe uh, you've seen in your own life how people's opinions of things change our devotions, they change our likes, they change so many other things. Maybe you don't like a, a certain kind of food, but the girl or the guy you like does. And so, oh, we're eating that. Maybe you don't like a certain thing that's out there, but your boss loves that. So, man, that's what you're doing. You're, you're sucking up to the boss in that way. I remember uh, there was a kid back in my youth group years and years ago who used to be very emphatic, very excited about things. He would come up and say, hey, what do you think about this band? I think they're great. And he'd pause for a second. Don't you think? Looking for approval. And I've watched that occasionally if that person, the, the, the guy he was talking to, said, no, I don't like that or I disagree with that, man, that, that opinion would change very, very quickly. So easily built on the opinions of others. So, so hung up on that. You know, that young man was confident, kind of. Kind of set. Almost. Is that where you are? Are you kind of set? Are you pretty sure? Or are you dead set, fully assured because of the Holy Spirit of God living in you that God's way is the right way and that people might come, they might have a loud voice, they might pour things, they might have influence in your life, a position of power, but they do not compare to what God says about things. When we start to think about things from our own way, from the world's way, from the opinions of others, that's where we start to compromise. That's where we start to say, I know the Bible says this about marriage and about sexuality, but that doesn't feel right because my friend has a louder voice. 
You know, I, I know that I should be good, I should be generous, I should be giving, I do all these things that God would say, but I don't really feel like doing that today. I'm just going to walk into my own thing and my friends tell me that's the right way to do. You do you. That's walking in foolishness. It's walking in arrogance, quite frankly. When we're supposed to be submitted before God, we, we bathe everything in prayer. We look at everything through considering the things of God. Looking at Him first and foremost. We don't live by the opinions of man, but by what God says. You know, the opinions of man is deadly. Proverbs 29, 25 tells us, The fear of man lays a snare. What is a snare supposed to do? It's supposed to catch and kill an animal. It traps you there. But whoever trusts in the Lord is safe from those snares. You put your trust, your faith, your hope, your whole being into what God says and have nothing to do with the things of the world because they will corrupt that. Verses 23 and 24 kind of conclude his little bit of look at wisdom in this section, even though we've talked about it multiple times throughout this, this sermon series. It concludes this by looking at wisdom and grasping the things of God where it says, we ought to take comfort from our Father's protection and our Father's provision. We ought to see this from all that we've talked about today as we consider the things of God that He is trustworthy. Isn't He? I mean, we trust Him with our salvation. We're, we're putting all our eggs in this one basket. We're saying, I know there's a lot of religions out there. I know there's a lot of different quote-unquote gods out there. But there is only one true and living God. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who came to earth, lived a perfect life, died a death that we deserve and should have died, paid the penalty for our sin, and then He rose again and said that anyone who would believe in Him and that work that He did could be saved. We are putting all our eggs in the basket of Jesus, you saved me. It's not me saving me. It's not me believing you and then doing good works to provide my own salvation. It is Jesus, you did the work, all my eggs, everything. I'm putting everything I am into this, all my hope, all my trust, all my faith into the salvation that comes from Jesus alone, right? We believe that. We've got to, if you don't believe that, you've got to start doing that. You put all your faith into Jesus alone. And if we trust him for our salvation, our faith is there, why would we not trust him with our money? Why would we say, I can't give? Why would we say, Jesus, I trust you with my salvation, with eternal life, with trusting that I'm not going to go to hell because of you, but I can't trust you to help me make a wise decision here. I can't say, God, that your word is the way to go because I think this is a better way. Why would we trust him with our eternal salvation, our eternal security, and not every single thing that is left here on earth? It would be the epitome of foolishness for a person to say, I trust Christ with everything except for what I'm doing here and now. Wisdom lets us walk that way. It gives us consideration for that. And wisdom strengthens us so that we don't worry about those in positions of power. We don't worry about the opinions of people. Wisdom strengthens us in the Lord. We trust Him with our salvation. True wisdom, seeking and knowing the Lord, would say that we are wise, we would be wise when we trust in Him and we are foolish if we don't. If we don't give it all to Him, if we don't lay it all down before Him, we're going to be missing so much. We will be living foolishly. Wisdom considers the things of God. Wisdom finds strength. Wisdom provides rest. So the question here as we, as we wrap this up, just, just quickly kind of bringing it in here, bringing it home, will you trust Him? Will you trust Him? Will you walk in wisdom? Will, not will you say, yes, I agree with the points that you have made today, Carl. I see, is what we want you to say, I see God working. I've considered the things of God, and I'm going to push that other thing to the side. I'm going to bring these other new things in. I'm going to take that accountability. I'm going to join that small group. I'm going to start serving at the church. I'm going to start giving this way. I'm going to start ministering to my community. Whatever it is, I'm going to start considering the things of God, and I'm going to start acting appropriately knowing that when I do that, I'm walking wisely, and that brings me rest. That gives me strength. It gives me the things that we need by focusing on the things of the Lord. That's where we find that peace, that trust, that everything we're looking for, the contentment that our bodies, our hearts, our minds, our souls are so desperate for are found when we walk in wisdom by considering the things of God. Living God's way leads to a better life. Living God's way leads to a better life. May we all commit together to spend more time with Him that, that that trust might be strengthened, that it might be built up all the more. May we do that for His glory and His benefit. So as we end here, as we, as we pray here in just a moment, I want that, that question going in your mind. Will you trust Him? Will you trust Him? I think Solomon and this message today has made a pretty strong case for trusting Him. 
Church, this is not about finding just uh, peace, happiness, and, and great things in life. This is about finding the contentedness in life that we are all desperate for and the one that will, by God's grace, honor Him and help us to live rightly. Will you trust Him? Let's commit this to prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us to trust Him in this. Just as the, the disciples prayed, Jesus, teach us to pray. Jesus, increase our faith. May we pray that kind of prayer today as we commit this to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful today for your word and for your wisdom. And Father, I know there are so many people today who, who might be watching this that have so many different pieces of life. Some may have the best time of their life happening right now, and some may be walking through the deepest, darkest valley of struggle and pain. Lord, I pray through your Holy Spirit that you would help us to consider how you are working in both situations. And Lord, may we rejoice in both. May we submit ourselves to you knowing that it is through these struggles that we grow greatest in our faith, that it is in the good times we rejoice all the more in what you have provided. But Lord, through all this, may we keep a wise perspective that always considers the things of God in everything that we do. Lord Jesus, may we rest in you by walking wisely. I pray your Holy Spirit would anoint us to do this. And I pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit to convict, to encourage, to equip, to guide, and to help those who are thinking about this right now, Lord, as we ask. Will I trust you? Or will I trust you when my thoughts contradict what the scriptures say? Will I go your way? Lord, will I follow what you say about things and not the opinion of other people when it contradicts you? Lord, may we walk in wisdom together. May we work together heartily and, and just put our whole selves into advancing the kingdom by sharing the gospel, by loving people, by planning churches that love God, that love others, and make disciples who do the same. Lord, may we connect people to Christ by doing that as we seek to fulfill the great commission you've given us. Lord, we love you. We praise you. You are a great and a wonderful king. We are thankful that we are not left just twisting in the wind here, Father. We have clear direction from you. And we'd be wise enough to seek it from you. We commit this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, church, let's continue committing these things to memory and to mind and to heart as we spend a moment here worshiping.